time to dig deep. Real talk, big topics. Now, let's dig in. All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome to this latest episode of We Gotta Talk. I am Sunny. This is the place for real talk on big topics. If you're familiar with the format, um, typically what we do is we pick a big topic every week and we kind of dive in at various angles. And I'm really excited about this week's guest because we're talking perseverance this week. And our guest is an Olympian athlete, Kelly Gunther. She is a speaker She's an Olympian athlete. She's known as the comeback kid. And when you hear her story, you will understand why. So we're going to talk today all about why it's so important to keep your spirits high, even in the lowest of times. And Kelly has really, really gone through some stuff that's going to help um, really bring home that point. She's going to tell us how she managed to stay positive and to not only get back in the game, literally and figuratively, but to get back to uh, peak performance, to, to, to compete with some of the best people in the world in her sport. So let's welcome Kelly to the show. Hey, Kelly, thank you so much for being here. Yes. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much, Sunny, for having me. I'm such an honor to be here with you today. You are a, such a bright light. We were chatting before, and I know that you have made a big transition from going from training and competing in the athletic world, and now you're on this space, which is um, sort of getting into the speaker circuit and helping inspire people with your story. We're going to get into the specifics, but I do want to lead off with why your nickname is the Comeback Kid, because this is pretty incredible what you've gone through. Thank you so much. Yes, the comeback kid really just come from the ABC Olympics when I happened to make it um, in 2014 Olympics. And I had just really got the name from everything that I've come back from um, a learning disability, diagnosed as a kindergartner and dealing with that um, my whole entire schooling. I always say it doesn't just go away. Um, it's something that I will always deal with, with battling different challenges you know, every single day. And then um, just coming out from everything on the other end, I, I just was nicknamed the comeback kid. And it just really has stuck to me looking back um, throughout my story. It's cr it's incredible how many things you have managed to flip the narrative on. And you mentioned a couple here. I do want to mention, I should have said this in the beginning, speed skating was your sport, is your sport. Are you still like doing that in any capacity, even though you're not technically competing at that level right now? Unfortunately, I am not. Uh, and I say that because there's only two long tracks in the US. So in Salt Lake City, uh, Utah, and then Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So if I wanted wow. to skate long track, I would have to go to those two. But uh, we're coming up in winter you know, season here. So I kind of get eager to put my skates on and just kind of skate around at the local ice rink. But to skate skate, I'd have to go to those two places because it's a 400 meter track. So we're going to get into this, Kelly, but you came back from an injury that almost severed your foot from your leg. It doesn't get much more serious than that, especially when you're competing in a sport that's all lower body focused. Let's start in the beginning though, and how you got into speed skating. You're in Ohio right now. So I know you're in a, and you're from a climate that experiences a change of seasons, unlike here in Florida. So how, how did this all start for you? Mm -hmm. Thanks for asking that question. Cause I love um, starting really from the beginning because it really started uh, when I was a little girl, I can remember sitting Indian style um, as if it was yesterday, watching the 1994 Winter Olympics take place in Nagano, Japan. And during that time, I was watching figure skating and I was watching them, you know, just be so happy to get land every jump perfect, come out of every spin and the smile on their face. You could tell that they worked their whole entire life um, for to be able to be so present in that moment. And not only that, but I think what really caught my attention is them telling their story through the music and the audience being so engaged. So as I was that little girl, I sat there, you know, Indian style and said, I want to go to the Olympics. It happened right then and there. Now I'm going to tell you for starters, I did not know what the Olympics meant at that time <laughs> or what they were. Uh, but being back here in Ohio, I actually went to the local roller rink and I started as a figure skater and I just fell in love with it. I put on a pair of skates, laced them up. And for 25 years later, I had never took them off. And the little clip there was I was a little too fast for the music. I couldn't hear the beat of it in figure skating. And for me, I loved being a girly girl. The hair and makeup it was always my favorite. But I had gotten introduced to inline speed skating because essentially just got to go fast, turn left, and that's what's taking me halfway around the world. 
Well, that's insane. Okay, wait. So you mentioned this, and I, I think this is probably a big part of your story and some of the challenges that you had to overcome. You mentioned a learning disability that you were diagnosed with in kindergarten. Can you tell us what that was or what that is? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it really is just a simple learning disability. And I say that because um, not too long ago, I actually went and saw a neurologist because I'm working so hard um, to get out there in the speaking world and to tell my story. I had said, I just need to focus a little bit more, you know, and the doctor had said, no, Kelly, you, you just have a learning disability. You don't have ADHD or any of that. It's just a simple uh, learning disability. And it's come down from, yes, I was diagnosed at kindergarten um, where it's just hard for me to grasp the concept of learning and comprehend. Uh, but I'm so thankful for that. I was so embarrassed in middle school and high school um, of it because I always wanted to be the girl that, you know, made friends and fit in and all of that. Um, but I, when I actually made the Olympic team, I'm still friends with my special ed teachers today, actually. And one of them had said, you know, Kelly, just think about how many people you can help by telling your story. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, you know, and I'm in my mid twenties, I don't even think about it because I was actually still embarrassed I, by it, even though I was out of high school, then it, you know, out of that scene. And I had just said, yeah, you're right. I, I want to help everybody else be able to believe in themselves because I never believed in myself. And having that learning disability, it's become a huge part of who I am. You know, your story too is interesting too, because what you come from or what, what you don't come from, you mentioned before we started going live here and recording that you feel like you've overcome more than just your learning disability, the lack of, like you said, an actual facility in your hometown to skate. Mm -hmm. um, tell us what else your childhood was like, because when you're speaking to people, you're not just referencing your athletic career and the nearly life-changing, forget career-changing injury that you came back from. You're also referencing uh, physically where you came from and how many obstacles you had to sort of hurdle to get where you are. So talk to us a little bit about how you grew up and where you grew up that influenced this desire to do better. Mm -hmm. It really came down to, you know, being catching on to skating so fastly and knowing that, you know, learning wasn't going to be my specialty in the books and having that be able to be such a, a gift for me, I say, and my mom just really looking at it as pushing me into skating. Uh, I grew up here, um, Lorain, Ohio. There's not much um, to it. It's very, you know, slow paced and whatnot. And I grew up with a dad also who, um, I had alcoholism um, problem, and that for me was really hard to to learn and really understand what that was. And when we would go skating, it was always sometimes negative talk, like you you, you suck, you're never going to be good. Um, and you know, as a ten year old little girl, that was really hard for me to learn, and I I didn't know why you know that was being such hurtful things that would come out of my father. And my mom and I had then picked up and moved to Michigan at 11 years old. Uh, and I then ended up going to middle school and high school there from there on out. And at that point, that's when my dad really took a back seat of my life. And I was really starting to gain on me more and more as I got older. Um, so much so when I went to high school, as I said, I, I wanted to be that girl who really just pushed her way in and, you know, wanted to make friends. But I would start to s listen to the conversations that they were having and they would talk about their parents and, you know, one maybe did this and the other did that. And as I sat there and I absorbed the conversations, I would always say, "What? I wonder where my dad is. And it got to the point where I had to see a counselor um, all throughout high school and I can remember talking to this gentleman, if I was talking to him today, and he would always say, because I would always go in, and I never cried as a teenager, but I would always cry when I was in his office. And I would say, I don't understand why he doesn't want to be in my life. I, I call on every birthday. I call on every holiday. It came down so much so that it was even begging. And he would always hand me the box of tissues as the tears were running down my face. And he would say, but Kelly, you're the only one that's getting hurt because you keep trying and you keep putting out, but you get nothing in return. And go ahead. Well, I was going to say that's, that's hard. Mm -hmm. I feel I'm not a therapist, but um, mm -hmm. that's hard for a kid to, that's a hard concept for a kid to grasp. I don't know that I would say 
to a person struggling. Oh, it's your fault. I mean, I, I God, I want to like crawl through the screen and hug you right now. But anyway, go ahead. That's interesting. You know, an interesting response. He's correct. Um, mm -hmm. But it's it seems like it probably it was a hard concept for someone at that age to grasp. I'm sure that was difficult. Yes, it was very difficult to grasp. But time and time again, I think hearing that, I was starting to realize that he was right, the, the counselor, the therapist, because I was kept trying. And essentially, I was the only one that's getting hurt because I was getting nothing in return. And that's all I wanted was just a pickup of a phone call. And as you know, years went on, as I got older, 17, 18, and all I ever wanted was a phone call, I wasn't going to get that from a birthday. I would stick those memories out of my memory box and pull them out on those hard days and say, remember, he's he's right. I, I can't keep trying. You know, I'm the only one that's getting hurt. And then I kind of just woke up one day and said, you know, this is how it's going to be. I'm going to mm -hmm. love my dad for who he is. And I'm, I'm so thankful that I went through that process because he's made me strong. He's made me the back bone of who I am. And essentially, you know, I think that was a part of the comeback story is because from 14 to 22, I had never seen him. Wow. And where does the relationship stand now? How are mm -hmm. you guys? He, as I get older, you know, in my early twenties, I kind of let him in my life a little bit because then I understanding what alcoholism was. I starting to know that if it was something that was off the limb, you know, said maybe it wasn't him talking, it was the drinking talking. And I was very cautious of how and what I would say. And I think that helps me a lot, you know, understanding what alcoholism was versus a 14 year old little girl who didn't know what it was. Mm -hmm. And um, I had seen him for the first time at 22 and the only time because um, a year later then he had passed away from a massive heart attack and uh, in 2012 and it hit me harder than I think that I could have ever imagined. Um, so, but so much so that it helped me, you know, be able to talk and tell my story because that's why, you know, I'm, I've overcome so many things that wasn't just, you know, skating or learning disability that I've overcome, but through all of that. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I, I, I have a lot of sympathy for you and I'm glad to hear that you were able to process that with mm -hmm. a professional and in a way that helped you move through it because, um, I'm just sorry that you had to go through that. Thank you. I, I do want to know what training for the Olympics was like. So here you are, a young girl in Ohio. You're overcoming things already to even figure out that, okay, I have a talent here. I'm going to work on this. My mom and I are going to move to Michigan. We're going to get out of Dodge for a while. We're going to make this happen. What did those early training days look like for you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's funny because I started out as a roller skater. And so at 19, I had still never put ice skates on my feet. Not once. I was like, I hate the cold. I don't want to be cold. I don't want to go ice skating. I wanted nothing to do with it, legitimately. Um, but I still knew at that age I wanted to go to the Olympics. And while I guess I was still quote unquote young, I was like, I better try out this whole ice skating thing. And so instead of going to the local ice rink or the ro local roller rink, I decided to move halfway across the country to Salt Lake City, Utah, and put skates on my feet and give it a go. And two years out, um, I tried out for the 2010 Winter Olympics in Vancouver, um, Canada. That's where they're being held. And I more so skated those Olympic trials to, to get the experience, you know, to get the feeling because I had already known my eye on the prize was for the next four years out. And, but what do you do when you make it for 24 hours and then you're taken off um, by rolling? And that's really the part, an, another part of the comeback story right there. Yeah. Tell us about, okay, so where does the injury figure in? So what happened in those 2010 trials mm -hmm. and when does this potentially career ending injury come into play? Yes. Uh, so as I said, I skated the 2010 um, Winter Olympic trials to, you know, get all the emotions out, the feelings. So I was ready to go in 2014. My bread and butter race was the 1000 meter, which is two and a half laps around the 400 meter track. And I was named to the Olympic team. I was going to Vancouver ever since I was that little girl sitting Indian style. All those emotions come out, all those dreams. I was going to the Olympics. Uh, I was, you know, in drug testing, doing the whole nine yards. Well, while I was in drug testing, the girl who had got third place, who was my biggest competitor, I had found out she was getting a rescape. Um, she reskates an hour later, 
And my best and my favorite scenario to always explain is to show is that a baseball player gets three strikes and you're out, right? We all know right. that. Or anything else in sports, three strikes, you're out. Well, this day, this player or competitor got a fourth and final strikeout. And with that fourth strikeout, earned her a personal best time that she's ever skated in her whole entire life. And I was taken off and she was put on. Wait, we have to pause here. What? And why did she get a reskate? I'm not familiar, obviously, with the rules of like the Olympic trials or in this sport in particular. So how does that happen? Yes. Uh, I get sometimes your your question is as good as mine. Uh, she was, as I said, with a fall, she fell about five to 10 meters to the finish line, sliding across it. So, I mean, it was still good enough for third place. And the head referee, who was from her hometown, went up to her and asked her if she wanted a reskate. And I guess that's how it happened: is that she got a reskate, gets that personal best time that was faster than mine. Um, I was new to the sport, as I said. Uh, I was like, I don't know how this is fair. We did an arbitration because even the U.S. Olympic Committee was kind of unsure at this at this point. And in the arbitration, we had found out that she had gotten different names, um, teams from a reskate, and they just had ruled the ruling that she was going to be put on and I was taken off. Okay. How do you get over that? I, as an adult, that would be difficult for me to want to continue. But as a, as a kid, that's got to be even tougher. Mm -hmm. It really was tough. And this is probably my favorite part of my story is going through that. And I say that is because in life, we always, get, we always get these choices. We can stay in that pit and decide to be miserable, or we can decide to get out. First and foremost, I will say it was hard for me that night. Absolutely. I cried. I asked why life wasn't fair. And I couldn't understand this concept of somebody getting a fourth and final strikeout and that be right. But I also knew I had another choice that the next morning that alarm clock was going to go off. Practice was going to go on with or without me, unfortunately. And I had that choice to either make it or not make it. And you better be damn sure that I did show up for practice the very next day. Um, again, it was not easy. I definitely cried. The whole Olympic team was there. They're all geared up, getting ready to hand it off to Vancouver. And I just got a taste of that medicine for it to be just taken away. But the athlete that I was going to become was going to happen in that exact moment. And I knew that I had to be better, faster, and stronger because in the next four years, nobody was going to take me off on an Olympic team. I was going to make it fair and square. And that was the end of that. There was just a period at the end of that sentence. Like I, I was going to be there. That is so, that's very grown up of you and very, um, emotionally intelligent to like come to that realization quickly, got to show up for practice, got to get my butt back to the rink or whatever you call it. The, what is it called? Is it called oh, a rink? Yeah, I call it the rink oval. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I commend you for that. I think a lot of people would spend time, a lot of time asking why and for various tragedies or difficulties in life, we do that. And so I give you a lot of credit for doing that. So what did the next four years look like? Um, you get your stuff back together mentally, you're, you're back out there training, walk us through what those next few years look like. Absolutely. Well, the next four years take us through a little bit of twist and turns because, um, as I said, I knew I had to be better, faster, and stronger for the next four years. So I finished out the 2010 Olympic season, and I was skating the very last race in Salt Lake City it was in March, and it was the very first race of the entire weekend. I was racing a 500 meter. And for starters, I'm no way a true sprinter. So it takes me a second to get off the line and get moving. But my favorite is always the corners. So I make my speed in the corners and I was heading into my very first crossover. And all of a sudden, my foot had a different plan for me that day. And again, if anyone can imagine a baseball player sliding into home plate with their arms out in front of them and their feet up behind them. And one from a, sp a speed skater to a baseball player and maybe a half a blink of an eye. And that being said of having the fall, it was, I was in the outer lane. So five long track speed skating, you race the clock. It's kind of like swimming. You're in your own lane to yourself. Nobody touched me. Nothing happened like that. It was just that my foot was not in the ice that day. And because I was in the outer lane, it got stuck from underneath the pad and the torque of my body, what we can figuratively have 
probably put all the pieces together is what caused it from it to detach from my leg. And I was oh like, Oh my gosh. So how bad, like what was left holding after that injury? Um, I, pr I was probably hanging very, I, I don't know by how much because the paramex had always said, and it was even in that moment I had asked him when I was going to be able to skate again. Oh and he always laugh and joke and said, Kelly, your foot's hanging off your leg on the way to the hospital because they took the blade off, but they left the boot on. And they said, if they took the boot off, there was no telling if the foot went went with it. Oh my gosh, Kelly. Yeah. That is insane. Okay. Yeah. So you have proven that you have a pretty positive mindset. Your track record is very great. I, you Thank have you. at this point shown that you are able to bounce back from some serious mental obstacles, but what are you telling yourself after this, after what you've already <laughs> been through? Yeah, it just gets better. Um, and you probably wondering, like, how does it get better? Uh, uh, again, I was that girl who never got to go to college, never got to experience that. But I always wanted to live at the Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs. And it's a huge campus as probably felt like a university. Instead of going to class, um, we were going to practice. And there was a cafeteria, dorm rooms, you know, a lot of athletes get to live there. And I got the opportunity. So when the doctor had walked in and said, I get to do my rehab at the Olympic Training Center, I don't think I could have been any more excited. Uh, the first month was miserable because I was still on crutches and a boot. Um, didn't really make friends that quick, but then it changed. And I had fallen in love. The men's gymnastics team was based out in Colorado. Uh, I had never been off my skates for that long my entire life at 22, 23. So I didn't know what to do with myself. So my rehab every single day, twice a day became my life. And I just made the best of it. And that support group in Colorado Springs became my my everything. And they wouldn't let me leave Colorado. And so I could even put a skate on and know if we could do it. So we went to this little tiny, tiny ice rink, um, right down the street from the Olympic training center. Uh, the head doctor was there. Um, the sports therapist was there. Um, my head trainer was there because we had no idea. I mean, we were lucky enough to get my foot back into a skate and know if I could do it, but I did it. And then I was able to, to keep skating. So what from from the point of the injury to when you were able to physically put pressure back on it and even begin to train, what what length of time are we talking? Um, about six months. Wow, that's pretty impressive. Yeah, because what, then I was able to put a skate on within six months. And then within probably seven, eight months, I came back and made a World Cup team um, with a a plate and 10 screws and that then was taken out exactly one year later and when the doctor took that out that's when he would have known if the foot or it didn't need to be amputated but it didn't so so wait they were they were making that assessment well after the injury the mm -hmm. potential for amputation why is that because you would think that they would decide that early on like right after the injury why are they waiting a period of time and moreover why are they waiting after you're walking on it and training on it again to decide if they have to amputate yeah um, I think because just to see like how the bones were, um, if they were able to come back and how he wouldn't have known because that hardware had to be in there for a year. So when he had taken that out that exact year later, then I guess that's what it would have shown him if the bone, if everything grew back together and the blood was flowing um, back into the ankle, which it was. Oh my gosh. They just didn't me. always tell me that that was the case to be imitated, which is probably a good thing, but. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay. So here's the million dollar question, because like I said earlier, you've proven yourself to be a person of a positive mindset. You're getting over a, a bad relationship with your alcoholic father. You're getting over moving locations so you can train better. You're getting over a huge, huge disappointment in qualifying for the Olympic trials and then getting pulled back. And here you are getting back in the rink after this horrible injury, give me your life mantra or that phrase that you repeat to yourself or that prayer that you say that is inspiring you, Kelly, to get up every day and decide to show up because this is some magic you have here. Yes, um, thank you so much for asking that question. I feel like it just like brings tears in my eyes. Um, I think you just you just have to keep going. Like you can't take no for an answer. And that's what I always just kept thinking is that, 
I have to overcome if I want to get there. And I can't be miserable. No matter what I tell myself is just to just to keep going, Kelly, you you got this. And just take deep breaths. I can remember going back into the ice and being so scared. But knowing that if I didn't face that fear, I never would have been able to skate again. And finding what you love is so important. Because uh, then just two and a half years after I did my whole process of rehab, it was really now go time for the Olympics and try out for the 2014 Winter Olympic team. And just having that, what I've looked at past in my life, knowing that, you know, I've already done the hard work. Now I get to do the fun work. Oh, I love that. Okay, so what was that like? Let's let's go back in time to that point. You're recovering from the injury. You're back in training. How did it feel? Let me ask quickly before we move on. Uh, when you first put pressure back on that foot, or when you first got back into the rink, because I can imagine you were a little maybe trepidatious putting weight and pressure on that foot in that setting. Yes, it wasn't so much um, the pressure going back on my foot. I would more say. It was more harder to get and go back to the ice rink of not having my team than I had in Colorado because I was alone, essentially. I'm now walking back into Salt Lake City of not having my team with me. And, you know, I'm going back to where I just did the arbitration, where I had just fallen, you know, where all odds were stacked against me. Now, how was I going to do this? But I knew that I had to go back into that rink and I knew it was going to be hard. But I knew how determined I was within myself, and I knew how bad I wanted. And not only that, I knew how proud I wanted to make my team that just put all of that hard work together. And here we are now. Yeah, tell us about that. So it's how many years, I guess four years, right, after that first kerfuffle uh, <laughs> in, in trying to in qualifying and then not going to the Olympics in Vancouver. Tell us about this next trial and, and how that was like set the, set, set the scene for us that day. Yes. Uh, so in the Olympics, yes, happen every four years. We call them every um, quad. So now we're about two years down as I just walked us through that process. And now we're about two years out. It's really now your go time. Um, your training becomes eight hours to nine hours. That's all you're doing. Your sleep becomes so important where sometimes it's the most important thing to be able to get ready and to train for that next day. And I, it was now time to head up to Van, or Sochi Winter Olympic Trials in Salt Lake City. And I sat in my one bedroom apartment in Salt Lake City. And I, the night before a race, it was a Saturday night. I was racing Sunday of the 1000 meter of my bread and butter. And I just sat there by myself, as I said, and I took a really just deep breath. And I said, whatever happens tomorrow is going to happen. Rather I make this Olympic team or I don't, how many people can say that they tried out for the Olympics? And just four years prior, I had absolutely no idea if I was ever gonna be able to skate again. And I can't wait to head to that starting line. And that's essentially why I was just so excited to hear that gun go off. I was so excited to stand there and say, you know what, I'm not racing just for myself anymore. I'm racing for my doctors that just put me all back together. I'm racing for everybody who believes in me. I'm racing for my dad who I had to go through that, but I felt like that he was standing there with me on the starting line that day. And I had a lot to prove. And because I had been so strong that, you know, I wanted to not just prove that to myself that I could do it, but that I can just skate again. And I was telling my story as I was, as I watched those figure skaters in 1994 when I was that six year old little girl. And on that day, I raced the two and a half laps that were given to me. I skated a personal best time. And that put me on the 2014 Winter Olympics, Sochi, Russia, and I set it off. Oh, that is, so, what is that <laughs> feeling like? Oh my gosh. Walk us through like the level of exhilaration when you get that mm -hmm. PR, that personal record, and you're, you know, you're going to the Olympics. Mm -hmm. It's, it's such an like unreal sensation. Um, I can even remember waking up the next day and I'm like, am I a, an Olympian? Like I can call myself that. Like it just feels so um, unreal sometimes, but it was such a magical moment for me to be able to remember all of what I had 
you know, gone through my whole entire life to have that dream, you know, come alive and have those goosebumps and know that I earned my spot fair and square. I skated a personal best and it was just because I got to have fun with it. I got to, you know, not just skate for myself, but for everybody who was on the team with me. I think a lot of people who aren't elite level athletes wonder what the mindset is like when you go into a race like that, or they're a high stakes competition. Like, how do you get out of here? How do you do it? It seems like the pressure of the world would be on you. And yet you guys go out there and make it look so easy. <laughs> yes, honestly, I feel like it's almost like a catch 22. Um, some of my best races, I've kind of gone in with an attitude as if I don't care, you know, sort of, which I do care. But the less pressure you put on yourself, the better it is. Because at the end of the day, it's all a mindset. And I say that as so there was World Cups I wanted to make so bad that I over skated the race because I wanted the World Cup so bad. And it was in, because I was on my own head. I tried too hard. What so, does the over skate mean? Like when you over skate the race? I just didn't even think about the race. I just went when the gun went off and skated as fast as I could. And it, it didn't do me any good because I didn't follow the plan because I was so excited to be able to get there. Uh, so is there like technique and tactic involved in like when to push, when to slow down? Like are, as we're watching you guys like do these laps, is there like technique behind this? I always thought it was just like, go as fast as you can and like, keep your fingers crossed. Yeah. Sometimes I did too, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, yeah, so the better you stay on tact um, with your race times and what you're going out to essentially skate for. So there is a lap counter. So your coach stands on the back stretch of the ice and has a lap board. So if 29 seconds, that's one lap. And if you know that's your target, time that you want to get, then you go off of that each lap. So that kind of targets you from where you are in the race. So you're breaking it down into smaller goals within the bigger thing. And that helps you not like try to take too big of a bite out, so to speak. Exactly. Yeah. Because if you have a target race plan going into it, so say two and a half laps, I would want to skate and my best race, a 27 second lap. And then if I would, I only would want a second drop. So like a 28 or a 29 second lap, that determines when you come around of how much you're on that target of that time in that race. So longer the race is, the more you're able to calculate it within your head, but you really just want to stay lap by lap by lap. Yeah. Well, it's like a metaphor for life, like one lap at a time, exactly. one, one problem at a time, one challenge at a time. Okay. Um, well now take us to the Olympics then in 2014 and, and how that experience was. Yeah, that was really a dream come true. Uh, you know, walking in through opening ceremonies and everybody chanting USA. Again, I had never missed an opening ceremonies ever since I was a little girl, rather it was winter or summer. And I couldn't believe that I was able to walk through the tunnel of representing the United States of America and having the flashing lights as we see if you watch opening ceremonies and just live that moment. It was something that was just so special. Um, and for me, I was Neville, a metal contender. You know, my story was just more so, you know, to get there and have that excitement. But I always say if I were to have a gold medal moment, it was stepping onto the ice for the very first time for my 1,000 meter and having my head doctor, who is my head doctor in Colorado Springs, be in the stands as he was the head doctor in Sochi, Russia. And just remember thinking, stepping on the ice for that race, having that head doctors and trainers be in the stands when just four years ago, we had no idea and we've all made it we've made it and here we are. That's so cool. Oh my gosh. So how, how walk us through the rest of that experience. You say you're not a metal contender, so you're not out there for the race. That's what that means. No metal contender just means I wasn't like a gold medalist favorite. Oh, got it. Got it. Okay. So yeah. what did you end up with? Tell us where you ended up in the grand the tally. Ring, yeah. I was yeah. 33rd, um, of the whole United States or the whole country. Sorry. And, uh, yeah, so that was my, that was my ending and the experience was just, um, incredible to be able to go to that starting line. What does it feel like to hear 
like the crowds cheering and to be like literally with the best, most talented athletes in the world, like all surrounding you. Did you feel like you were just floating? Yes. And again, it feels so surreal to be around, you know, the best of the best because, you know, there was Shawnee Davis who was a gold medalist in Vancouver, you know, so he's on your team. And, you know, so to be around other medalists and, you know, to be in that stance and to be in their presence is something that is just to me, so remarkable. And, you know, it's just, I just, I just love athletes because I feel like they're always a different breed. And, you know, so to be able to, to be there as one is, is a really cool and essential feeling. Yeah. Let's talk about that. The lessons learned in competition and in sports in particular, where you're sort of marrying the challenges of the mental obstacle Mm -hmm. and the physical obstacle. What was it that you noticed about elite athletes, Olympian athletes, you and the people Mm -hmm. that you competed with that makes you guys different from the regular guy who really Mm -hmm. wants to be good, but maybe doesn't make it to that level? Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. And really down deep, I think it's just something that's implanted in with you into you. I don't know if it's like a God's given gift or really where it comes from, but you just find this determination within side. I almost want to say like your stomach inside your soul and you, that's all you think about and you are almost obsessed with it and you're not going to stop until you get there, no matter if you have to work harder, stronger, faster, or whatever it is, you are just so strong and your mind is just so powerful that nothing that is set in front of you is going to stop you. And I think that's why the the different athletes, you know, are separated because life is, is a challenge and it's hard, but it's how strong you are within who you are and how connected you are with yourself to be able to know how bad you want it. And that's really where I've come to within who I am is that even with my speaking, it, it feels like I've put skates back on my feet is because I'm so obsessed with it. And you have to almost marry that career, as you said, where that sport to be able to, to finish it, to finalize it, but to also have a life outside of it soon. That's so, so important to be able to have that balance. It sounds like the mental dedication is what sets you all apart. It's, it's the unwillingness to quit. It's the not hearing no and, you know, just making it happen come hell or high water. Yes. Sometimes it's harder to take the nose, but yes. <laughs> oh gosh, I can imagine. And you know, I mean, as, as I'm taking in the totality of your story and for anyone just joining, I mean, Kelly, an Olympian, an Olympic athlete who has overcome so many personal challenges as well as athletic challenges. I'm looking back and not to be that person who says it all happens for a reason, because we always want to kind of strangle those people when they say that. But when I look at back at what you've told us, the challenges with your father and the challenges with your health and the challenges with your injury and the injustice of that being taken away from you in 2010, do you feel like it all prepped you for where you ended up? 1000%. Um, so don't strangle me because I am one of those persons. That I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. I, I mean that in jest, but you yes. know, I guess because when, when it's all happening, the last thing you want to hear, I'm sure as your foot is dangling from your leg, if someone said to you, Kelly, it's happening for a reason, you would be like, get away from me right now. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. Um, but you always have to find that silver lining. And I think that's why I always gravitated towards that saying that everything happens for a reason, because I always found that silver lining, whether I was in that pit and didn't think I could, no matter what I was going to find it, just as my foot was hanging off my leg. Um, I knew that I was going to surgery and I knew I was going to be able to skate again. And in that exact moment as well, that thought of never not skating again never crossed my mind. It didn't even, you know, come through. And then having to be able to be able to experience that at the Olympic Training Center, again, I found that silver lining. You know, I never got to go to college. So I looked at the Olympic Training Center essentially as my college. And for me, it was so special because of having a learning disability and set out a little bit different. I was just like everybody else. You know, I, I, instead of going to practice, so I was going to rehab where, you know, rehab became so fun for me because I got to do it every single day. And there was, wasn't just me in rehab. It was the whole entire Olympic community. I mean, Michael Phelps was coming in and out, you know, different things like you're just 
I just always found that positive. And in school, Mm -hmm. you know, I never was the girl that believed in myself. Never, not whatsoever. And I say how I've overcome that is something that's probably one of my biggest gifts. Because if you ever would have asked me, Sunny, if I would have been a public speaker, I probably would have laughed at you and said, absolutely no way. I'm, I can't talk in front of people. I don't even believe in myself. But I overcame that to be able to show that you can do it because I was that girl that walked that line. I was that girl who sat there and wondered, you know, why don't, why aren't I pretty enough? Why don't I have a boyfriend or whatever X, Y, Z is that has gone through my own head to be able to show that I have overcome it. And I'm proud of who I am because of that, the bad stuff. And that mass has really just become my message. And I, think that is just what is so important for who I am is because I found all of those silver linings within it. I, uh, Kelly, I'm, you're, I'm trying to crack your code here because you are (laughs) emanating such um, drive and, and positivity. And I just, um, I, I keep coming back to this question, but asking how you, how you tick or breaking it down to the micro level of, um, how you find yourself inspired now speaking and getting on the speaking circuit is your newest challenge. And you're, you're getting into yet another new world. And what are some of the things that you're telling yourself? Like run us through what goes through Kelly's mind as she goes through the next thing. Because I, I do think an Olympian athlete has a proven track record of being able to mentally defeat challenges and mentally overcome challenges. So run us through like a typical inner dialogue that goes through your head whenever you feel challenged, because there are plenty of us, who need something like that to, to lean on in difficult times. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks for the kind of like diving into my brain a little bit, because it's been a little bit harder to say the least, Um, you know, coming from such a high end of everything I knew, you know, I put skates on my feet and it was easy. I knew how to skate and turn left, but this whole day to day life for me and other Olympians, uh, you know, it's harder for us because We don't necessarily, we can't control our speed anymore. I can't control, you know, the emails that I get back of the negativity of not wanting me to come speak at your school. And, you know, it's very discouraging. And for myself, I had to have a little prep talk and kind of go back to essentially the only thing I've ever known. You know, I was a speed skater for 25 years. That's half of my life right now. And say, okay, Kelly, what do you know? You know how to put skates on and do that. I'm going to do that the same exact way, but in a different way and use that same mindset as if I'm not going to practice every single day to push myself, but I'm going to sit in front of my computer and push myself. So you go back to what you know and use that strong mental mentality because it's going, it's not going to be easy And that day-to-day life is never easy. But if we find that silver lining within that, I think that's what makes us each individually so powerful and who we are. So if there's, you know, like any moms or whoever's out there listening to know that we go through those dog days to get to those good days and we go through that pit to be able to get out of that, that pit makes us strong within who we are and that obsessive, that's where that really comes in. You know, like I'm not going to quit because I keep getting no from principles. No, because I'm obsessed with it. And once you know Mm -hmm. something that you want so bad. I think that's where the determination comes in. Nothing stops you. That's where I I feel like I identify with you. I'm far away from an athletic, you know, an an elite athlete, but um, obsession, um, like I recognize that. And and I, I, you know, I think that's the important lesson here is that you can say, okay, I want this. I want this. But when you're obsessed with it, when you dedicate time every day to it, when you think about it and you meditate on it and you manifest it and you blah, blah, blah. Like that's, that's the, seems to me from an outsider's point of view, the difference, you know? Yeah. Just saying that is like a partially, it used to be OCD really had to work through that kind of gal. So I identify with that. <laughs> yes. like there's a benefit to really being able to um, center on something and just yes. continue to revisit it. So tell us about, yeah, tell us about where Kelly sees herself, mm-hmm. not to get all third person on you, in okay. you know, five, 10 years. Um, you're, you're beginning to look for some speaking engagements and get some speaking engagements across the country. Your story is so compelling. So I know this is going to take off for you. Um, tell us where you see yourself. 
Mm -hmm. Thanks, Sunny. Uh, yeah, I really see myself um, again at the Olympics, but in a speaking, you know, sort of way where I want this probably more than I think I did when I went to the Olympics, because now I get to share and tell my story. So within the next five, 10 years, you know, I want to be selling out arenas. I want to be in, you know, New York's uh, Times Square at um, that big arena. And my brain just lost train of thought of what it's called uh, there. And, you know, writing books and inspiring so many as I can and just being Kelly and the down the girl earth girl that I am the next door neighbor who, you know, if there's anybody who's having a hard time, whether if you're five or 95, I always said we've been a kid once in our life. You know, we can always be a kid again. We can always come back because we're always going to be facing a challenge and always coming back. It's never butterflies and rainbows. So Within the next five, you know, to 10 years, I hope to be a well-known speaker and, you know, be on the circuit and telling and sharing my story. I'm, we're manifesting that here for you today. Right now, Kelly is going to be a New York Times bestselling author. She's going to be a TED speaker. What else can we throw in there? I believe in you. This is Thank like this. You. Yes, I do. Oh I, I, you're you're scrappy. You're smart. You're obviously incredibly talented. So um, you have all of our full support behind you. And I can't wait to see what the next five to 10 years brings for you from our perspective. I want to round things out, Kelly, here mm -hmm. with just one more bit of advice for anybody since the theme this week that we're circling on is perseverance and mm -hmm. overcoming challenge. Um, give us some parting words of wisdom as someone who has been to the depths and has come back up. Yes, absolutely. First and foremost, you know, let persevere. I, I love that word. So let it become one of your favorite words. Don't laugh at me. I know it's hard in that middle of that storm, but you know, to really gravitate towards it and to know that it's, it's going to be okay. Yes. I, as you just heard my story, it sometimes sucks in the middle of that pit. I get that you get it. You know, you're going to be able to get out of it. And to also know that we have this choice in life. We get, we can choose to stay stuck and never get out and be miserable. But do you really want that? And you really just have to ask yourself, you can't feel sorry for yourself. You have to be strong and who you are. And because sometimes you are your biggest cheerleader. And so be your own advocate, you know, be your own strong person within yourself. And I think that's really where I became so strong for who I am is because a lot of the times I did have to just be strong and be my own biggest cheerleader. But it was because of that I learned to to not stay and feel sorry for myself because the world wasn't going to feel sorry for me. The world goes on and it turns every single day as we see this life. And, you know, we only get this one chance. So to know for yourself that it sucks and say it sucks in that moment. Do whatever you have to do, but to know that you are strong, you are your own comeback kid. You know, just keep persevering, keep pushing on, keep believing in yourself and just never quit and become obsessed with what you want to be, uh, become obsessed with and, you know, conquer the world. Ah, oh, you have me like <laughs> with the chills over here, Kelly. I love it. Be your own biggest fan because you're right. Sometimes that's all we have when, mm -hmm. when, when others around you lose faith or they don't want to invest the time or the resources. Truly, that is yeah. who we end up with at the end of the day as ourselves. So mm -hmm. amen to that sister. Thank you. I appreciate oh, it. <laughs> you're so good. So many big things are ahead for you. I can't wait to say, oh, I knew Thank back you, when. Thank you, um, tell us where we can find you, Kelly, online and social media and where we can expect to hear from you next. Absolutely. Yes. Um, come follow me on Instagram. I'm huge, huge, huge um, present on there. It's just my name, Kelly Gunther. If you see two R's, don't be confused. That is me. Um, I would say currently Facebook, but unfortunately right now, I guess I'm hacked. So I'm trying to get that figured out. Yes. Um, oh. uh, yeah. I'm on Twitter. So go follow me on there. Um I'm an open book. So if you want to message me, DM, please do. I help any way I can. And I used to be um, present on Clubhouse here and there. Uh, but yeah, so kind of all awesome. over. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, well, we're going to connect offline. And I can't wait to see where you pop up next. Kelly, thank you so much for sharing your story today. Thank you so much again, Sunny, for having me. It was such an honor. Thank you so much.
All right, guys, thank you for listening and or watching to uh, this episode of We Gotta Talk. As always, we are so grateful for you. If you're a return listener, thank you for coming back. Please share this episode with someone or one of our old episodes with someone who you might think needs a little inspiration, a little information. Uh, we are so grateful for that. Also, ratings and reviews help a ton. If you listen to Apple Podcasts, just tap that five star, leave a review too, if you can. That helps get these episodes out to people who might find them useful or entertaining in some way. And that's it. We'll be back next week with more good stuff here on We Gotta Talk. Thank you again so much for tuning in this week and we'll chat soon. Bye.